This is A New Angle, a show about cool people doing awesome things in and around Montana. I'm your host, Justin Angle. This show is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Hey folks, welcome back, and thanks for tuning in. Today, I am speaking with Dr. Judith Weisenfeld, professor of religion at Princeton University. Dr. Weisenfeld is an expert on African-American religion and recently visited the University of Montana as part of the President's Lecture Series and Martin Luther King Day celebrations. I started teaching in the 1990s when we were in a particular moment of culture wars and I was being told the kinds of subjects I was interested in were illegitimate and not really interesting. So, you know, now I feel old and um, it's, I feel like I've been here before. In 2019, Dr. Weisenfeld was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Weisenfeld, thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so tell us, where did you grow up and what did your parents do? I grew up in New York City in Queens in a neighborhood called Laurelton, which is near JFK Airport, which okay. is probably the most of Queens that a lot of people experience. Mm -hmm. My father, he worked for the Social Security Administration. Mm. My mother when she went back to work, uh, was a, an executive in a student exchange organization. Mm. And it was high school students. And so American students went abroad, but her area of focus was finding host families for foreign students coming. And her areas of focus, totally random selection in some ways, was Egypt, Yugoslavia, Brazil. Wow. So she was able to use her languages and also just engage other parts of the world. And my parents really loved to travel to Yugoslavia as part of her work. So describe your experience as a student and, and, and sort of your path to becoming a professor. I'm a proud graduate of the New York City public school system. And I, I don't know what I thought I wanted to do. I actually thought I was going to go into engineering. I have a couple of engineers in the family. And I wasn't good in, in math or physics. So that, that kind of cut that out. But I just I went to college just thinking liberal arts. I was interested in literature and arts I, I, and music. I play guitar. Hmm. I had done some theater stuff in high school. And so I was trying to imagine something like that. No one goes to college thinking they're going to major in religious studies, I think. And it might be changing, but I didn't know it was a thing sure. that you could major in as an academic field. And I took some courses in, I went to Barnard College uh -huh. in, in New York. And I took some courses that were just interesting. I learned about history. I learned about the world, how people make meaning in different cultures. It just seemed to me to be a, a window on everything, hmm. on history, on literature, on um, politics, economics. You know, you could find an angle about everything through religious studies. But I was in college in the 80s, and there were campus protests to get um, colleges and universities to divest from investments in apartheid South mm, Africa. Yep. And I was involved in those protests on my college campus. And a visiting faculty member was teaching courses on religion and politics in South Africa. And I started to see how I could connect what I was studying in a kind of more practical way. So it wasn't just absorbing all sorts of things, which was great. I yeah. was learning so much. But I started to see its relevance sure. in the world around me at the time. And so in the end, I ended up uh, majoring in, in, in religion and writing a senior thesis on the influence of the black theology movement, which was a movement in uh, African-American religious life um, starting in the 1970s, a figure, James Cone. The influence of that theological movement on anti-apartheid work in South Africa. So I drew that connection, and that ultimately led me into deeper interest in the history of religion in African-American life. That experience, seeing the connection between your studies and a current social issue of the times, has that been something that's carried forth into your teaching and research currently? I always start with a, with a historical question. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not one to necessarily enter our project thinking, you know, how can I rewind to, to figure out the roots of this thing? Although that's how it 
I convey the significance of certain things to my students. Oh, we we need to know the backstory to this. Okay. There's a history to this. I have questions about the past. That's what drives me. Um, and then people ask me, well, how does that relate to the present? Sure. And I always, I always get really awkward and fumble that kind of answer. But, but it's important. I mean, I, I think bo- both of those things are necessary. So one, to engage the, the present and say, how did we get here? What is the backstory to this? But what really drives my scholarship is how did that happen in the past? Yeah. And to then later think, um, what are the afterlives of this? What are the trajectories? Because it's never it's never a straight line um, of causation. And so I want to resist just projecting things back. Yeah. But I, but I think it's really important to to recognize that how we approach the past is necessarily animated by who we are and what's happening around us now. Sure. So. You're a professor of religion, focus on African-American religion in particular. Just generally, how would you sort of position yourself on the intellectual landscape? Where, where, where do you sort of fit in and what questions are you trying to answer? I've been mostly interested in the early 20th century period, and a lot of my work has focused on religion in the urban north. And so in that sense, I did... I did set out to ask questions about the the world in which I grew up. Um, that is, you know, New York City, urban environments, and to think about the city as a as a category, right, as a place, as a as an entity that enables, that fosters certain kinds of religious possibilities. And where I pick up the story is in or the variety of stories most most of my work in this period the great migration when in the early 20th century large numbers of uh, southern african americans migrate to northern cities mm-hmm. and and to think about what happened in those environments what did the city do to african american religion what did african american religions bring to the cities and and also think about migration from a little bit migration from the Caribbean to these cities at the same time. So okay. what what are the cultures in there? I wrote about a, a set of new religious movements that are founded in the urban north in the 1920s and 30s that are really uniquely the product of this population shift and certain politics of the time. So people might be familiar with the Nation of Islam. They might think of it in relation, if they know anything about it, to Malcolm X from the 1960s and 70s, but it's founded in Detroit in 1930. Okay. And so I have written about a set of groups that offer uh, people of African descent in the United States different ways of thinking about race and different religious orientations than the Protestant Christianity that had been the dominant and continues to be the kind of predominant religion. I came to that wanting to know what what was going on in the cities at this time that all of these different groups are coming into being and attracting people to them. What questions are they answering for people? What are people seeking? So I'd love to hear more about your recent project on psychiatry, and particularly psychiatry after abolition. Tell, tell us how you got interested yeah. in How did this question even arrived on your radar sure. screen? It emerged from this last book I was talking about just now. Uh, one of the groups that becomes popular in the urban north in this period is called the International Peace Mission. And it's founded by and organized around a figure who called himself Father Divine. And his followers uh, embraced him as as God in a body, hmm. probably born in Maryland, and he have kind of obscured his his history. His mother was probably enslaved, okay. and he migrated to New York, and he gathered a very large movement around him, multi racial movement as well, but predominantly black. And they were based in Harlem at the time, and they lived communally. They lived sex segregated celibate lives and took new spiritual names and so it's a kind of 
there's so much press attention to this this group. He was a political figure. New York politicians would come and try and you know get his endorsement. Okay. His followers were they lived these celibate sex segregated lives and so they let go of their families they abandoned families often and that sometimes meant that they left children mm-hmm. to join these communal communities and the family court judge sometimes sent members of this group to a psychiatric hospital for evaluation okay and so as i was writing this book i came upon these published psychiatric studies about these members of this group, which would have been cast as a cult at the time. And I have lots of thoughts about that term, yeah, yeah. which I don't use. But I just was so intrigued by the the idea that psychiatrists, white psychiatrists were, start, were theorizing about African-American religion and making claims about a kind of essential black psyche that participation in this group revealed. And so I just kind of pulled a thread to see what else psychiatrists had to say, if anything, about the relationship of race and African-American religion to mental normalcy and deviance or disorder. And it just a whole world of things tumbled out of it. There's a suggestion that this field of psychiatry and, and maybe white culture in general had deemed African Americans, former formerly enslaved folks, unfit for freedom, and that comes forth in some of this psychiatric theorizing that you're talking about. One question I asked about this early theory that that a lot of other scholars hadn't in my reading of the of the histories of of race and psychiatry now was who were these doctors? Yeah. And what I and what did they bring to the table? How did their background shape what what they were um, talking about? And one thing I found was that they were, by and large, um, very committed Protestants. So they mm-hmm. brought to their evaluation of African American religion their own ideas about what religion should look like and what is good religion for civic participation. And a really surprising number of them had been enslavers or came from enslaving families. Oh, okay. And so when I f- figured that out and I thought about the kinds of arguments they were making, that slavery had actually been really good for black people mm. and that now, left to their own devices, they don't want to know what to do. And that's why um, we're seeing this rise in, in uh, mental illness. It really changed my perspective on on the theoretical literature that does make this argument that the Negro, to use the term they would have used, um, or the colored race is needs oversight, really, was what they were claiming, right. and that the end of end of slavery was was a bad thing. We'll be back to my conversation with Judith Weisenfeld after this short break. A new angle is supported by First Security Bank. Blackfoot Communications, and UM's College of Business. Access to capital, broadband, and education are three ingredients any community needs for success. This is Meg Oliver, CBS News correspondent, and you're listening to A New Angle. Welcome back to A New Angle. I'm speaking with Judith Weisenfeld, professor of religion at Princeton University. Do you have a thought about, like, is this simply racism amongst a group of of white doctors shopping around for an explanation? Or is this a racialized view of religious practice as, as deviant in some way? I don't see it in the end as a sort of after the fact justification. Okay. In that these producers of what is ultimately racist psychiatric theory are in the in this early period in the late 19th century they're they're men by the early 20th century you get um, really quite a striking number of women hmm. in early psychiatry but they're men who are committed to a certain kind of social order so they believe in a in a hierarchy yeah. but they believe in in a social engagement and a and a kind of 
care. They're involved in charity organizations. So they're propagating these racist theories. They're doing so because they're they're invested in kind of public institutions in a way that that they're they're bringing their backgrounds to it and they're trying to shape society. But so I don't see it as a kind of after the fact. Sure. Thing. Yeah. And I don't. It's hard to kind of reconcile. They're 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 slightly progressive in that way. They believe in public good. Yeah. And what you're in, describing is sort of a beneficence in yes. a way, a warped right. sense of Correct. it, but almost like a part of a, a, a mission to do some public welfare work. Yes, that's exactly right. That's sort of a grim thought to think about how that's grounded in a, in a racialized view of the world. And that calls us to think about the ways in which we might also do similar e- things. Exactly, right? yeah. Right? So, but do we see vestiges of the, those effects in, in current day medical practice, psychiatric practice? Our current landscape is one in which we hear a lot about racial disparities in medicine. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of good work on that. Um, and I, I was, I had just finished the research for this as the pandemic took over and we started to hear a lot about racial disparities and deaths right in the pandemic and there's a way in which that discourse makes race the agent people died because they right were, right causal right yeah. rather than racism puts people in social circumstances in which they are at greater risk i started to as I was writing, all of that was, or just starting to formulate this this book, those legacies were, yeah. you know, hanging over me and, and death in my own family as well mm-hmm. um, in that context. And and the other thing that, that was also framing, again, not, to, not framing my writing, but that made me think about some of the resonances and maybe the significance of what I was working on was the increasing awareness through police killings of black men of this idea of excited delirium, Mm. which people may have heard about in relation to several deaths, George Floyd, Elijah McClain. There are actually quite a few of these police killings where excited delirium was invoked. That's a diagnosis that is very recent. So it's a kind of diagnosis of of an expression. So someone is in excited delirium, therefore the police must contain that person, or sometimes it's listed as the cause of death. When that person was contained, the excited delirium caused them to die. Is a very recent invention of a medical examiner. So there actually is precisely this um, a more recent version of the pathologizing of African and African diaspora religions in a kind of medical context that gave rise to this psychiatric diagnosis. It's not recognized by the Psychiatric Association, but the police use it sure. of excited delirium. You know, one of the the causes that the 19th century psychiatrists list in relation to African Americans, and it's not exclusively, but it becomes much more commonly associated with African Americans in the 19th century is religious excitement. In the wake of this um, period we talked about a few moments ago, did you see any evidence of African American religious traditions changing practice in in a way? Was was that culture suppressed in some way as a result of being persecuted for, for the way the faith was expressed? One interesting complication in all of this is that when white psychiatrists are talking about religious excitement and the kind of excessive emotionalism and superstition of what they see, you know, that they see as characteristic of African-American religion at the time, and that's very common in popular discourse as well, it's something that black clergy are also a little worried about, hmm. you know, they would see certain kinds of um, enthusiastic practices, revival meetings among their fellow church members in particularly rural contexts as something of a problem, as a kind of public problem of 
lack of education. So they're always talking about, well, we need to make sure that we extend education because educated people would not act this way, which is, you know, clearly not true in the history of religions. They're concerned about um, a kind of public image of African-American life, and they want to bring people into conventional church denomination so that they can collectively represent the political, economic, educational welfare. The stigma in public culture, in medicine, that's coming from from white theorists is also met by certain worries and uh, reform impulses among some black clergy right. as well. Yeah. We have a blending of cultures and a changing of a of a rights regime mm-hmm. basically and and how do you it's a difficult thing for society to manage and not that it couldn't have been managed a lot better than we have or had and have but it's, yeah what you're describing is it's a it's an interesting mix of forces i think at that time certainly in the the period immediately after um the civil war after reconstruction you know we all think like the black church is something that you know it's always been there it's always mm. been like that but this is a period in which it's kind of coming into the possibility of it being um public and nationally after um emancipation black churches are stepping forward to be um both the source of support for black communities and the public representation uh right political leaders it's not it's it makes sense that civil rights activism comes out yeah. of black churches but to understand this period that you're ta- in the way you're talking about it is to to recognize that what comes out of it that that black churches are the public voice in certain ways is something that took a lot of work to do and it was a lot of work on the part of black leaders to convince black communities that yeah. that this is, you know, one way to do this. So we're talking at a time when higher education, particularly elite institutions, have come under a lot of fire. You know, people have talked a lot about the testimonies of the you know, Harvard, Penn, and MIT presidents in front of Congress. As a member of the faculty at an elite institution like Princeton, just describe what that environment is is like right now. Do you have these have this sort of has this public conversation touched your life in some way? I think there's a lot of searching for ways to undermine higher education and the humanities and the um, and the kinds of tools that historical thinking provide students with. I started teaching in the 1990s when we were in a particular moment of culture wars and I was being told the kinds of subjects I was interested in were illegitimate and not really interesting. So, you know, now I feel old and um, it's, I feel like I've been here before Mm. and yet things like social media really amplify it. Um, And so the kinds of emails I might get or responses um, on on social media were just didn't happen in the past. I, I used to get hate mail in the mail, you know, and that was a, maybe a little bit more frightening when you had to open an envelope and you mailbox. see somebody's warped handwriting. Yeah. Or something. Every, everything I am able to do is because my family had access to public colleges and universities. And so I you know, not to just turn the heat from Princeton, but I'm much more concerned about the attack on public education. Mm. My sister just retired from a long career teaching at New Jersey City University, and that's the kind of institution that we should really care about what's going on and yeah. what what students there need, and not what presidents of of um, very wealthy institutions have to say. Not that uh, not that we shouldn't. I. I, my president has had excellent things to say about some of this, um, about the institution's values on free expression and um, care for members of our community in, you know, whoever, all, all members of our community. But it is dispiriting, the kind of attack on public goods 
and on libraries, on teachers, on public education. And then I also, the last thing I'll say is that, um, again, the difference between our kinds of institutions is that, you know, there's a luxury certainly in um, at a place like Princeton for students to study all kinds of things because they'll go out and someone will say, oh, you went to Princeton, and so maybe I'll hire you for this thing. I mean, they, they are feeling pressure to not major, but certainly from their parents, to not major in things like religious studies. But, um, you know, I wish for every every student in every institution the, the freedom to just explore their passions and what their imaginations tell, tell them is possible. You're here as part of our Martin Luther King Day celebrations. Talk about your connection to his, his legacy and why it's important to you. My mother was an immigrant from Trinidad and Tobago. Hmm. And my father was first generation. His parents were born in Poland and Lithuania, and he grew up in Brooklyn and Williamsburg. My mother was Catholic, was very, very Catholic, and my father was raised Orthodox Jewish. Hmm. And they were married, they were actually married in Trinidad, but they began their lives here in 1954, so before the Montgomery bus boycott, before Brown versus Board of Education. Um, I was born before um, the Loving v. Virginia Supreme Court decision that overturned the law that prohibited interracial marriage. Mm -hmm. And so I, I grew up in, in a world of, of, you know, my parents were, you know, they weren't activists, but they were very sharply aware of how their lives were restricted in this emerging civil rights movement and how their lives changed because of the civil rights movement. And so, and it was, you know, they had a lot of, of there was a lot of pain. And it's not something that they talked about a lot until we were older. I grew up just very aware of, of what it meant for them. And they, they upheld him as someone who, who made meaningful change in the world that was m meaningful beyond them and to our family. And, uh, you know, I vote in every single dog catcher election because my mother impressed upon me that that is, you know, I, that is what the civil rights movement was about. And those are principles we, we value. Well, Judith, it's been a pleasure learning more about you and your work. Thank you for visiting with the University of Montana and our students and sharing some of your story with us today. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a generous gift from UM alums Michelle and Warren Hansen. A New Angle is presented by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business, with additional support from Consolidated Electrical Distributors, Drum Coffee, and Montana Public Radio. Kelly Larson is our producer. Maddie Jordan is our production assistant. VTO, Jeff Ament, and John Wicks made our music. And Jeff Meese is our master of all things sound. Thanks a lot, and see you next time.